In the novel, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe by Charles Yu, the narrator says, Today is the beginning of the end, or the end of the beginning. He has killed his future self and is going back to his past to do it all over again. This all sounds very trippy, but it's also par for the course in science fiction. That's why I decided to ask science fiction writers what the future self means to them, starting with author Charlie Jane Anders. I think that the future self is sort of a mythological figure that we conjure in order to motivate ourselves in the present, in order to justify ourselves or make sense of our lives. And oftentimes, if you're thinking too much about your future self, it means that either you're facing a huge choice or a huge challenge in the present, or your present really sucks. And like, it's actually an indicator that present you is getting shortchanged in the name of, of some future version of you that's actually a, a mirage. One of my first short stories that I wrote, which nobody's ever read really, was about someone having lunch with their future self and their future self has become a supervillain. And because their future self is a supervillain, they're eating all the most cruel foods. They're eating veal and they're like, that's how you know your future self has become a supervillain because they're eating really, whatever the opposite of cruelty free foods are, they're eating those. And so, you know, it's just, why did I become a supervillain in the future? The future self reminds science fiction author Tobias Bakel of a thought experiment, the ship of Theseus. You know, we think of ourselves as like a coherent being that travels from one point to another. But the truth is, I often think about the fact that we're constantly shedding, you know, our cells and our, our being. And the idea of Theseus' ship is that, you know, if you replace all the planks in a ship, is it still the original ship or is it not? Science fiction gives us a chance to imagine all kinds of futures, some of which may not be so far off from what actually happens. It's not like we can predict them as science fiction writers, right? But just getting like, you know, a group of 10 to 15 science fiction writers gets you like that shotgun blast where between 15 of us, like we're going to give you a wide range of scenarios. And probably one of those might end up being, you know, close to what happens. It's you know, kind of like maybe you should have a team of people that sits there and thinks, how horribly can this go wrong? And maybe scientists should be asking the same question science fiction writers love to ponder, how terribly wrong things can go. Take it from Daniel H. Wilson, a writer and robotics engineer. I started out as a scientist and I was extremely optimistic about all of this stuff. And, and I mean, a lot of times as a scientist, you're just making it possible, right? You're not really thinking about exactly how it's going to be applied. I mean, the purpose of the imagination is to to think of a different version of yourself without having to become that version. You know, you think about what would it be like if I tried to jump over, you know, that gap? Would I make it? Would I not? So I think that having all of this technology that can simulate humanity and that can really act like us and, and come to the human party with us, I think it gives us this opportunity to imagine a better version of ourselves in the future a better version of ourselves. At the end of Charles Yu's How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, it turns out the narrator is okay, or at least it seems that way. The last page in the novel is left, quote, intentionally blank. For Philosophy Talk, I'm Holly J. McDeed.